Hello and welcome to this webcast on project recovery to the iDesign alumni. My name is Juval Lowy. I'm the principal of iDesign, where we specialize in system architecture and project design. I'm also the Microsoft Regional Director for the Silicon Valley. My recent book is going to be the fourth edition of Programming WCF Services, hopefully out early in 2015. I was part at the time of the .NET and the WCF Strategic Design Reviews for Microsoft, wrote many white papers on those technologies, speak at conferences. Microsoft has recognized me as a software legend um, due to the impact I've had on the industry over the years. And if you need to reach me after this webcast, it's iDesign.net. Let's talk about our agenda for today. I'll start by describing the what and when of project recovery. And then we'll discuss the recovery mindset, what you need when you're doing software recovery as far as the zen behind it. And then I'll go over a set of recovery techniques. And if we have time, I'll discuss some issues involving long-term recovery. And it's important to phrase it because recovery is often not what you think as far as the uh, uh, timeline. So what is project recovery? Project recovery is rescue. It's the stuff you have to do to save the project from being canceled. Project recovery is not long-term rehabilitation. It's a short-term recovery. It's fixing this project. Recovery is not happy times. Recovery needs to be stern. needs to be ruthless. If you're afraid of hurting people's feelings and people are very sentimental about these things, don't do recovery. Recovery, on the other hand, is hopeful times. It's the first time that a morbid project sees some light at the end of the tunnel. Now, not all projects can be saved, and so you have to assess the possibility of recovery. When you're dealing with project recovery, you have to ignore the long-term problems. Your objective is to fix this project now. Now, there's never just one cockroach, and so we know that there's many other projects that need help and such, and the rest of the organization can wait its turn. Your objective is to fix the project, not the organization. In fact, sometimes when you do project recovery, it may even go against the strategic goals of the organization. If you want to move to the cloud and this project is not cloud-based, it doesn't matter. You're fixing this project. Now, when you talk about long-term recovery, that often involves cross-project constraints, especially with development uh, process and issues of maturity. And if we have time, we'll discuss those. Recovery may require going back to the basics. Um, those were often the root cause of uh, uh, the failure. And that, in turn, may include long-term benefits, but that, indeed, is secondary. The goal of project recovery is to set the project again on a credible schedule, budget, and workable quality. Recovery almost always requires negotiating a new schedule, highly calibrated to what the team can actually deliver as opposed to what you wish they would be able to deliver. It requires new scope, often new resources. And this negotiation is predicated on the fact that the alternative is zero. And so since something is better than nothing, you have a lever as you're negotiating these new terms. Recovery is a limited time of strong intervention. Now, a classic mistake is keep doing the recovery method on a regular basis. The recovery techniques are so effective and turn around so quickly a disaster, there's always a temptation of keep doing them as the regular modus operandi, and that is a mistake. Now, when you're doing recovery, don't flush the baby with the bathwaters. Even though there's enough blame to share, allow the offenders to stay if they wish so. Now, when do you use project recovery? Recovery is not every time you're missing a schedule. For that, you have to use proper project tracking, proper project management. When you're doing proper tracking, proper project management against a good project design, your adjustment should be minimal and minor. Use recovery when there's no hope of ever meeting any deadline or staying on any budget or basically shipping anything. The other case to use recovery is when quality is completely out of control. Now, the absolute pivotal sign of using recovery is when the project becomes a lie. And when the project is a lie, it's across all stakeholders. Nobody trusts everything or I mean, anybody. Everybody is basically lying to each other. Status reports are completely disconnected from reality. And this disconnect is either cognitively people know that they are false and they still submit those status reports or because they truly have no idea what the true state of the project is, 
and so basically they are lying about the status of the project. Now this is uh, kind of like the terminal state, but other signals were there in hindsight, and so there's early signs and late signs. Early signs of the need for recovery would be that the project keeps missing preliminary deadlines, and even worse, you actually know it's missing, but don't really acting on it. Another early sign is chronic leaking. People are constantly working on other people's projects. Any basic hygiene, uh, basic hygienic uh, procedures and process is missing or is abandoned. Uh, source control policy and discipline is abandoned. People uh, don't comply with checking in and checking out. People stop reporting, collecting metrics, tracking the project, acting on that. People start letting go of testing. Another early sign is missing a major release, uh, as opposed to missing some preliminary deadline. Another early sign is high turnover rate, and the reason is the rats begin to abandon the sinking ship. Another early sign is customers are simply leaving. Other early signs are what are called 9-11 style events. You had to recall a release. It was so bad, you had to recall it or you cause some data corruption or damage to a customer, or some customers are starting litigation against you. The late signs look like this. All fixing attempts make things worse. People are working chronic overtime. Customers now have no hope of ever receiving the system. There's high tension, strained relationship across all stakeholders, from customers to managers to developers to support guys. There's constant air of despair and customers and managers contemplate cancelling the project. They still don't they're pull the trigger, but they're contemplating it. The developers and the rack and file have very low morale and there's lots of gallow humor jokes about what's going on. Any attempt of fixing the bugs increases the bug count. You're stuck in this perpetual Red Queen race where, like Alice in Wonderland, you have to keep running faster to stay in the same place. The terminal state of the project is it implodes very rapidly. The buildup for this state may have taken a few years, but once you reach the terminal state, it implodes rapidly. At this point, all best practices are abandoned. And there's always justification, oh, it's because of the deadline, uh, which we can't afford to do this, except you keep doing it all the time. The project becomes an effort black hole. No amount of effort poured into it ever goes uh, into anything. You literally cross the event horizon of uh, the effort. Any estimation you do yield further and further dates. So once you have a project that exhibits these signs, what are your goals? The first goal is to stop the hemorrhaging, stop the horrendous waste of effort and the turnovers and all the other bad things. Your goal is to deliver on a new date and scope. And project design would absolutely be key in achieving those. You need to restore trust across all stakeholders. Remember, the whole thing was a big lie. You have to restore faith in self-abilities. At this point, the developers and the managers simply doubt their ability to do anything good. You have to make the project manageable, regain control. You have to eliminate all the uncertainties about the future, and of course, you want to avoid the recurrence of it. A very important aspect of recovery is the mindset. As you go about recovering the project, don't focus on fixing the symptoms. While everybody is crying and screaming about the date and the budget and the quality, these are merely the symptoms. This is not the underlying disease. And so don't fix the symptoms. Don't put a band-aid on it. You have to address the root causes of the problem. Literally, don't confuse the cause and the effect. You have to do things correctly. However, how sustainable it is post-recovery is secondary. You have to do right things, of course, but there's a whole other world of long-term recovery which we may have time to discover and uh, cover here. The real problem is how to finish at all on whichever schedule or budget. And you have to communicate that to the management and stakeholders. You have to regain control. In fact, the root cause of project that need recovery is that there wasn't control to begin with. When you're doing recovery, you have to have decisive action. You have to do big changes. The time for the tweaks is long gone. In fact, lots of small changes tend to be very demoralizing. It looks as if you don't know what you're doing, so you tweak a little bit here, a little bit there. No, you want to do big, decisive changes, and you want to do these changes concurrently. If you feel of rocking the boat and hurting people's feelings, and you do this change and then that change, if you serialize them, you may not have enough time for doing it. In fact, you want to do the changes concurrently because otherwise it may take too long and you would cancel the project. And the whole purpose of recovery is to avoid cancellation. 
Now, when you're doing a recovery, you have to realize the opposite of the reason of failure may not recover the project. In fact, it often makes it worse. And the reason is many of the best practices are in the preventative domain. And so if you apply them post-disaster, you tend to make things worse. At the best, it's the equivalent of closing the barn door once the horse has already left, and so you're not doing anything. But at worst, it would be trying to put somebody on a treadmill after they had a heart attack. You know, if you run after a heart attack, you will kill the patient. The time to run was 20 years before the heart attack, not after the heart attack. Think of recovery as a bridge. It's a bridge from despair to delivery. And because it's a bridge, you have to do it in a time cap manner. And once recovery is done, once the patient is, is back and conscious, you have to revert to conventional project management and execution. Now, there is no formula for recovery. Every case is unique, just like every patient is unique. And unfortunately, past experience is very instrumental in successful recovery. So what I can do here, instead of going over uh, specifics, I can discuss general techniques and approaches that I find that work in general in any case of project recovery. And that will be the subject of this webcast. Let's talk about some recovery techniques. Now, before we do that, we have to recognize what I call the Zen of project recovery. And the Zen of project recovery is there must be willingness to change. Nothing matters as much. If the project, the team, the stakeholders are not willing to change, there is no point in doing project recovery. More of the same will not do. Now, it's very important to recognize that because you may be tempted to recover too soon. Even though the project is already doomed, if there's not willingness to change, then the recovery would typically make things worse. Now, in somewhat of a Machiavellian way, sometimes you recognize that the project will need recovery, but you say, let them experience more pain, because more pain increases the willingness to change. You basically have to gauge that and say, are they tender enough? And if they're not, let them suffer a bit more stew in their own juices before you can actually take it over. Now, the first recovery technique is a post-mortem. Now, sometimes you have to relabel it and call it a design review because calling it a post-mortem implies the project is already dead, which of course it is, but that may offend too many people. So you may call it just a design review. And the purpose of post-mortem is to find out why things went wrong, not what. You know what went wrong. You have to realize why. Postmortem should not take long, two or three days at most, and you construct it as a set of interviews, both individual interviews and team interviews. Now, the individual interviews are very good for two reasons. One, it's a great technique to get to know the individual team members and the stakeholders. It's also a great opportunity to construct some honest uh, uh, confession about what was going on. In the postmortem, when you're doing a cover, you want to listen. You're mostly read-only. You're listening to what went on. And an objective of the postmortem for the person doing the recovery is to gauge the willingness to change. Yeah, you know why things went wrong, but are they willing to change? You do the postmortem using what is known as no-fault analysis. Look, there's enough blame to share here, OK? So there's no point in saying he and he and he did, she did that. So you absolutely want to avoid finger-pointing. And you want to avoid the finger-pointing even during the interviews. When somebody says, Joe did that, well, no, 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 that, that, that's not the right way of doing it. Also, avoid having people or you label an entire person as, as wrong. Joe is to blame. A join always wrong is, is a bad way of doing it. And so also don't do open-ended time references. We never get it right. Are you sure you never get it right? Is Joe completely useless always? Maybe there's some use for Joe and so on. The important thing post-mortem is to focus on why certain behaviors contributed for the failure. And if you do no-fault analysis, you enable low emotional discussion. And you want to have this matter of fact, even friendly manner of a discussion. Yeah, well, that didn't work. So what do you think we should have done here instead? And you want to deal with the present and how to improve, not with assigning the blame. That's irrelevant for recovery. You want to go for root cause analysis. You have to identify why things went wrong, and what was the root cause. And the, root, the, the bug or the issue was never the symptom. It was what was the root cause. And so you have to track it, see 
where it was observed. In fact, if you understand the root cause, you can see where it caused other problems we haven't even discussed yet. Once you understand the root cause, you discuss how to fix it. And then, of course, you have to track it post, uh, post mortem to see if it's actually being employed properly. Now, going into post mortem, it's always good to prepare a list of classic failure reasons. Now, in each case, these will vary, so I'll give you some general categories. The first category I call deterministic failures. These are reasons that if you see them, the project has failed out of the gate. It doesn't matter what you did after. If you have those things, the project will fail. The deterministic failure is no correct project design. There was no correlation between the team's abilities and the schedule and the scope of the work and the actual time that was required to do it. You didn't design the project. Or you didn't have the correct system architecture. Or management had no commitment for quality. These are deterministic failures. You have one of these, you're dead. What if you assign resources and schedule in a death zone? When we do project design, we build a time cost curve and we show that all points underneath the D time cost curve are impossible to build. What if that is the deadline and schedule you assign to the project? The project has failed before anybody wrote the first line of code. What if the project design was viable, but it was high risk? Then again, of course, you will fail. What if there was no upfront knowledge of the true cost and schedule? then you're basically playing poker without looking at the cards. There's no surprise that you actually failed. Then there's execution failures. Even with the best project design, the best system design, did you actually enforce them? And of course, if you don't, then it doesn't matter that you had a good project design or a good architecture coming into it. Was the correct handoff? Incorrect handoff is assuming your developers can actually do things like digital design. And if they're junior, they can't, the project will die. Another execution failure is reverting to coding like hell, and of course, that's death. Or allowing quality to degrade and allowing the bugs to accumulate to the point that the system implodes. Then there's process failures. Did you do a software developer plan review? Did you do a feed me or kill me? Meaning, did you match the available schedule and available resources to the scope of work? Because if you don't, you will run out of time or money of both. Did you practice what I call bad or ugly agile? Bad agile is a fig leaf. You're still doing coding like hell, but now you can gloat about doing agile. Ugly agile is when you're doing things for the sake of doing it. You just go through the motion, but you're not actually doing anything. What was the communication between the team and management and the customers? If there's poor communication, then management and customers are in la la land, and then they're very surprised when it doesn't meet reality. Did you base master on features? That's a classic reason for failure process-wise. Features are always action of integration, not implementation. Features should come at the end, not at the beginning. If you do master based on features, you don't really have the features. You have uh, a shanty town instead of a city. Did you think through the impact of change once the work commenced? Or did you just went ahead and did things, and of course that caused a havoc and killed the project? Did you project the trend of the project, and then manage deviation from it. Because it doesn't matter if you collect the metrics, but if you don't act upon them, there's no point. Was the correct assignment of people along the critical path? If you're just throwing people against the project, they may be working on and off the critical path, which, of course, guarantees failure. Now, for each failure reason, you perform this root cause analysis. For example, let's talk about the architecture or project design. OK, so you had some kind of architecture and project design. Were there any good? If there weren't any good, there's a question, why weren't there any good? So the root reason was you didn't have an architect, or you didn't have a good combination of architect and project manager doing the project design. Now, even if you had a good architecture and project design, um, suppose they were bad. Why were you following a bad design? Why weren't you following a good design? These are all root cause analysis. Now, for each failure reason, you have to itemize how that specifically contributed for the failure. For example, in the case of architecture, did you have functional decomposition that made the project horrendously expensive to build, as we know functional decomposition always does? Did you encapsulate the volatility? Because if you don't, you have a development nightmare. Things change. It's like throwing a hand grenade into your system. Were the services in the air of minimal cost? Went too big, went too small, not too many, and not too few, as we know from the architect's masterclass. The services must be in the area of minimal cost. Did you have extensible design around the core use cases? Because we know that the trick is to design just against the core use cases so that every use case and every change will be just a different interaction between the services, not a different decomposition thereof. 
because if you design against the requirement, you actually guarantee the pain. And did you uh, uh, do functional design and therefore misled the customers to think they're going to get the, funk, the features on the first sprint? Part of the things you want to do is you want to measure the team productivity. And because we have hindsight here, you can see how much they were supposed to deliver versus how much they actually delivered. What improvement in efficiency was needed? For example, if the team needed to be 300% more efficient, then obviously the initial commitments were completely bogus. What investment in quality was missing? You didn't have enough testers or test engineers because if you didn't have that, then of course quality will die. And you also can actually examine the accuracy of estimation. As the project kept imploding, you can see what were the estimation versus what was actually delivered. And say, so, look, you were chronically in the mismatch of so many percentage. So now we know that if you want to change things, what was the correcting factor between your estimation and reality? Another great post-mortem technique is to take the traditional project design tools and produce what actually took place. And so you want to do a critical path analysis. You want to build a shallow S. You want to measure the efficiency or the expected efficiency. You want to measure the complexity. You want to show staffing distribution. And once you take the classic project design tools, applying them on a failure, it's very easy to visualize and to point out what has contributed to the failure. And the main reason you're doing these things, and I will reiterate it later, is not for you. You actually know these things. It's to actually drive the change and show them, look, this is what killed the project. Another project design technique, I call it be the wolf. In fact, all successful recoveries I've ever seen and was involved in had the wolf leading the recovery. Now, what is the wolf? Wolf is the wolf character played by Harvey Keitel in the movie Pulp Fiction, the guy that's being called to fix the bony situation of the headless body in the car. And you need that kind of a guy to recover the project and drive the recovery. And so Wolf needs to drive the project for a while during the recovery, not the project manager. And the reason you need Wolf is because those who derail the project are often ill-suited to fix it. They will just do more of the same, which of course will not work. Now Wolf needs to be seen only when necessary. You, want to be in the you don't want to be in the face all the time. Wolf needs to predict the changes in advance and have them seen come true on schedule and budget and quality and again rebuild trust and faith. Wolf must know the true state of things. Wolf often is a puppet master constantly pulling the strings behind the scenes, tipping people off and guiding them in the right direction. Wolf needs not be transparent. Transparency is excellent in regular project development, but it's not good for recovery. And the reason transparency is not good is first because it needs to be perceived as how things just work. And why would you want to be transparent? Why ask permission from those who didn't know enough and drove the project off the cliff in the first place? And so you need to know the limit and uh, just ask upon it. The wolf should quickly gain trust and confidence, especially of the senior executives. And you, the wolf needs to be publicly vested with authority. The wolf needs to literally sit on the right side of the top brass during meetings and have the authority or the top brass constantly refer to the wolf for, uh, so what do you think about that sort of a thing. In fact, a known technique is literally to choreograph a public conflict where the executive defer to the wolf and then back his choices. And then everybody says, OK, I guess this guy is driving now. The first thing you need to do when you're doing recovery uh, post post, uh, after the post-mortem is salvage. Now, you need to do a salvage operation. You start with a salvage analysis. You have to answer the question, what can be salvaged and what must be salvaged? It's not the same questions. You also have to know what must be dumped. Now, the way you answer this question is using quantified methods. You don't want to hear opinion. You want to measure the quality of the components, how many defects are logged against it, how many people actually worked on it. You want to measure the complexity of the components. Obviously, if there's high cyclomatic complexity, it's a bad component, which you don't want to salvage. When you're doing salvage, the sunk cost principle is your friend. How much time you worked on it is completely irrelevant. I call it milk under the bridge. You don't cry over spilled milk and it's water under the bridge or it's milk under the bridge. It is completely irrelevant how much time was already spent on something. Now, there's a lot of emotions and the emotions run high about something, especially if you spend a lot of effort on something which is a complete disaster. 
The only criteria for good salvage is ROI. And for each component, for each activity you want to salvage, you ask how much left to invest to salvage versus how much I'm going to get out of it. That is the only objective criteria for salvage. And again, you use quantified metrics using quality and complexity. Next uh, recovery technique is damage control. Other projects in the organization may be impacted or even gravely impacted by the failure of this project. And so the, one of the reasons you may want to recover this project is to contain the damage to the other project. And so why not start with that? Why not ask what you have to do to contain the damage to the other projects? In fact, it may not be too late to contain the damage for those. What I find is that often the other projects put so much pressure on this project that may have contributed for the disaster. And so by reducing the pressure from the other project, you increase the chances of successful recovery. And so you want to establish better expectation. You communicate to the stakeholders of the other project what you can do for them, how long will it take, and what they can expect. And you also want to have a viable choice here, which is letting this project fail in order to save the other project. Because what you don't want to do is having this project fail and taking the other project with them. And so maybe you want to cancel this project and salvage the others. Part of damage control is also to stabilize the quality. Quality got out of control. That was one of the reasons for recovery. And so you want to do a complexity analysis of the current code base. And there's, some kind of, there's always some kind of operated distribution because the defects are not spread uniformly across the entire code base. It stands to reason that 80% of the defects are, say, 20% of the components. And so why won't you just do a systematic complexity analysis of the entire code base? And we can also assume that the more complex types are going to have more than their fair share of the defect. And so once you identify the heavy hitters as far as complexity, fix those guys first, you will do more for stabilizing quality than anything else. You also want to go for the called quantified refactoring. Just moving furniture around may make things worse. And so if you want to do refactoring, that's fine, as long as you quantify it. And so you need to see there's going to be a square root reduction in cyclomatic complexity. We discussed why square root in the Architects Masterclass. So if the entire code base was 1,000 cyclomatic complexity points, you want to do refactoring that gets you 30. If it only gets you 800, it's not a good refactoring. It would may make things worse. Don't go there. Another recovery technique is what I call morale boosting. You see, past failures are weighing on everybody. Motivation is absolutely an idea. And because they have low morale, the motivation would be low. With low motivation, you're going to get zero productivity. And so you have to turn a corner here. You have to boost the morale. And so you start by making the team members feel important. Because remember, up till now, for months or even years, everybody was stepping over them. And because they were stepping over them, they feel unimportant. So you have to start making them feel important. And there's some low-budget, high-impact things you can do. For example, get them new toys. Order them a new Surface uh, laptop. It costs nothing. makes them feel important. Another morale boost is to move them out of their current location. Simply moving them to another building would kind of like get them out of the graveyard sort of a change. Maybe change the office type. Move them from uh, cubicles to walled offices. Invest in training. You see, just doing training for them would not just improve the technical skills, but would make them feel important. Allow time off. In fact, disallow overtime. They've been doing so much overtime and chronic overtime that there's a backlog of things they need to do. By allowing them to take time off to take care of personal things, you would boost their motivation. Focus their commitments purely on this project. They're probably being pulled in 10,000 different directions. Stop it. In order to recover, they have to focus on this project. Part of morale boosting is to be a sponsor for the regular worker bee. You have to care for them. Even take care of them. He said, no, no, you need that. Stop. I'll do this for you. Don't worry about it. This one is on me. And by doing so, the rank and file start trusting you. And when they trust you to become loyal, and when they're loyal, they will follow you over the bridge to the other side of recovery. You would also increase the productivity because they don't want to disappoint you. They won't be doing this for the project. They've given up on the project, but they will do it for you. Now, you may encounter some rotten apples, those who may have contributed for the failure, those who were basically rotten apples. Those you have to remove. Those will not be good to carry forward. In fact, 
You have to explain why you're removing those. It will provide closure for the remaining good people. Another morale boost is to change the manager's boss. So second level management on top of the team, that guy needs to change. Look, if this guy was any good, we wouldn't be here doing this recovery. So this guy needs to go. Another morale boost is to move the current manager to contributing roles. That sends a message. Everybody is in here together. We're all working on recovering this project. You have to plug all resource leaks. Nobody needs to work on any project besides this project. There should be no resource leaks whatsoever. If developers are doing some non-essential roles, like doing some technical support on other projects, they have to be released and focused on this project. Another low-budget, high-impact, morale-boosting technique is to hire admin to take care of taking the laundry and taking the car to service and taking the kids from the daycare center. Whatever it takes to allow them to focus on the project. So now they feel they are precious. There's an admin all of a sudden that takes care of things. And you have to invest in quality. Beyond fixing the quality problems, investing in quality means the code becomes higher quality and people start taking pride in what they do. If there's low quality, they are not proud of it and as a result, they don't do high quality work. You want to involve them in the estimation. We know it's not a good idea to land an estimation anyway, but this one is say, look, you are part of it, you're going to tell me how long this is take. I want, to get, I want to get an honest to God estimation here, but you're the one. I'm not landing it on you. You're the one doing it. Next recovery technique is devising a recovery plan. Now, in essence, the recovery plan is just project design for the recovery, or it's project plan just for the recovery. Now, it's different from other project plans and other mindsets for project design. First of all, this is the short term. While well, most project plan can be long term, a year or two, this one is only for the recovery. Now, when we're doing project design, we provide several options. Here's the fastest way of doing it. Here's the cheapest way of doing it. Here's the best way of doing it that balances time and schedule and risk and so on. Don't do that for recovery. You don't want the fastest or the cheapest or the best. Another thing is that when you're doing regular project design, we know it's predicated on having the correct system architecture. Here, the correct system design is secondary. You want to design against what you have, not what you wish you would have. In fact, doing it on any kind of schedule cost, as fast as fastest and cheapest, is secondary compared to the objective of releasing something. So you don't want fastest, you don't want cheapest. You want to design around 0.5 risk. In the project design tool that we teach in the Project Design Masterclass, we show how to quantify risk. And the risk is between 0 and 1. And we saw that the tipping point that balances risk, schedule, and cost is around 0 0.5. And you get to that point by decompressing the project away from normal. Now, another benefit of 0 0.5 is that it is the least acceptable amount of risk for the project. And that is key, because you want to maximize the chances of releasing something. And so yes, it will take longer, but you will maximize the chances of delivery, which is why we're going for 0 0.5 risk. Now, everything else in a project recovery design you know, just regular project design techniques and tools. That doesn't change. But you have to have these objectives you see on this slide. A good recovery project plan is meticulous. You literally attribute this to that and that to this at a very granular level. You want to have very low level of uncertainties. You want to have high certainty of success. And the reason you want to have high standard success is because you have to rebuild trust with the customers, the top brass, the stakeholders, the developers. Now, in order to do a good recovery, you have to have a top brass sponsor that says, yes, I support doing it, and so on. Again, that goes back to the wolf being vested with the top brass authority. Now, past part of the recovery uh, project design is to design the post-recovery project. But you don't execute it as part of the recovery. You just design it. OK, and once we recover, here's what we're going to do next. When you're doing project design for recovery, you have to establish a new architecture. Now, this new architecture may not be perfect or the best. Now, at iDesign, we, of course, espouse for the best architecture, and that's what we make a living for, except when it comes to recovery. The architecture for recovery must be driven by the salvage operation and the damage control. Again what must be salvaged, what, what was possible to salvage as far as ROI, what would minimize the damage to other projects, and so on. This kind of architecture tend to be warts and all. 
The objective is to ship something. Now, that doesn't mean that you never do a complete redesign. If what you have is a complete mess, there is no architecture, there is no clear delineation between components, there is no way of salvaging anything, so you know what, you have to do project redesign, as, as, as part, system redesign as part of the project recovery, and that is just fine. But it wouldn't be my first objective. Then you design the project against this new architecture. Again, new doesn't mean best. New means, in this case, warts and all. And you try and accommodate all the constraints that you have on this project and the risk, again, being not just 0 0.5, but also execution risk. You do this plan, you want to motivate all the stakeholders that somebody is actually driving here, somebody knows what he's doing, just like the wolf says, it takes 15 minutes to get there, I'll be there in 10. And then what you do is you deliver the first or two milestones of this plan on schedule and budget, and that basically will be the end of the recovery. Now, what are the planning assumptions you go into the recovery plan? First of all, you have to honestly know where you are and what are the true boundaries? What are the true boundaries of schedule? Is the deadline that means October, is it real? Or is it everybody is screaming like a headless chicken the morning in October because they're afraid they're not going to get anything in January? Now, what I find is by the time it's time to do recovery, customers be more reasonable because the alternative is getting nothing. Now, they could be holding and screaming and saying, we're not going to pay you, we're going to sue you. These are all more expensive options than getting something as opposed to nothing. And so they may be more reasonable now to discuss what you can actually deliver to them instead of what they wish you would deliver them. And so they're more reasonable, that's a lever. And now you need to negotiate a new deadline. Now, you calibrate this deadline based on the actual team productivity. From the post-mortem, you know exactly what they can produce you know what is the throughput, and so now you will calibrate something against that throughput. You also know now the true boundaries of resources and throughput. Look, if, if the team had 10, but only 5 people were actually working, then your team is 5, it's not 10. Deal with it. Part of recovery is, and recovery planning is to deal with the scope. Now, one, when you do the recovery plan, you want to go for stage delivery. In stage delivery, you also prioritize. You're saying, first we're doing this, and then we're doing that, and then we're doing this. And so, as you do the stages, you also drastically trim the scope, fitting what can be done in each scope with the team and the schedule we have on hand. Then, of course, there's quality. Now, there's also a true boundary for quality. Does it have to be completely out, out of every defect? Or maybe there's a way of uh, putting some uh, uh, corrective maneuvers and some workarounds until we stabilize the patient. And indeed, think of it as a patient in the ER, and you want to stop the hemorrhaging and make sure the, project, the patient goes into long-term recovery. Now, if the patient also has cancer, we have to fix the cancer, but you know, if we don't stop the, hem stop the hemorrhaging, the patient is not going to get to die from cancer. It's going to die from the hemorrhaging. And that's kind of like the mindset you have to have when you talk about quality. And that's what I mean is saying the true boundary of quality. Now, you have to establish the planning assumption. And part of it is getting clear objective from the start across all stakeholders. Everybody has to understand why you're doing this and how you're going to go about it. And you know, a project that needs recovery is typically in, in a complete fog of everybody is giving them wrong messages and wrong objectives. All of a sudden, you remove the fog, you're saying, here's what we're going to do, here's how we're going to do it, and this and that, everybody becomes more motivated. Now, another classic uh, project recovery technique that I use when I'm doing the planning is I pre-negotiate the mitigation. You can identify up front lots of risk of all the things that could go wrong. Arguably, there's a long list, just look at the post-mortem, and now you know what is the risk. These things can happen again, and so for each one of these risks, there's a mitigation. I can do this to stop that. What you want to do is you want to pre-negotiate all the risk mitigation. Say, look, if this happens, I'm going to do this. And if this happens, I'm going to do that. By pre-negotiating it from all stakeholders, you never ask for permission for doing anything right. You just go and do it. And this would make the recovery decisive, short-term, and effective. In fact, the ability to pre-negotiate these things I consider to be a precondition to recovery. If they are unwilling to pre-negotiate and agree to all the mitigation, they are not ready to recover. Another classic thing to do is to find option of mutual gains. Recovery should, or basically project in general, should not be a zero-sum game, meaning the customer gains an early 
uh, deadline and the team loses because they have to work like hell. No. What is the true mutual gain of everybody involved? And you find these things using objective criteria. Now, at this point, emotions run high. Everybody is very protective. There's lots of turf wars. So use measurements. You say, here's the throughput. Here's the quality. Here's the complexity. Here's the efficiency of this team. Here's how good the estimation were in the past. And say, look, based on these objective criteria, what do you want? What can we deliver and such? You ask people to look at it from the other guy's perspective. Say, look, customer, I know you want in October. This team cannot do October. They cannot do January. And talk to the team and say, look, you said this something. Look at the damage it caused to the other project and such. You constantly relate expectation to experience, to results. We tried to lose in the past. It didn't work. It took this long. It took this much money and so on. You have to know what is reasonable and make it so. And now is where project design tools become very important. You must build a time cost curve of this uh, project and the recovery. You must build the risk uh, charts. Use history, meaning in the past, every time we tried to do this project, it took us at least a year. Never did it in six months. Or in this industry, and you can use something like an estimation tool, this kind of a project takes this kind of time and it costs this much. Why try and go against the industry's own metric? Assign tasks based on wind condition. You know, why not have the developers that are supposed to maintain it also be the testers for the, uh, for the next stage? You know, I'm sure they're going to try and find all these things, all the defects, because it's going to be heaving on them if they have to maintain it later. Why not have the guy that needs to control the budget also be the guy that decides on the deadline? Because now it would come out of his budget, and you would explain to them along the time cost curve the impact of aggressive schedule on hemorrhaging the budget, and so on. Now, it's also a good idea in here to assert. Think of that scene with the wolf talking to the criminals in Pulp Fiction what to do. He didn't negotiate. He said, wrap this guy with a carpet, clean this with bleach. He told them what to do, and you need to do this as well here. Now, it's important to know when you have to communicate it that aborting is not an option. If you decide to do the recovery, Aborting is not an option. You have only one chance of aborting this project, and that was upfront based on willingness to change. Now, as you're doing the planning assumption, you do want to have some visibility. You want to keep all stakeholders informed on your progress design recovery. Because remember, emotions run high. They don't trust you. They don't trust anybody from the engineering team. And so you want to constantly show them that somebody knows what he's doing. Just like the wolf called back the mob master and told them, I'm in control here. Now, your plan must control the project recovery. Remember, losing control was the number one reason you need recovery in the first place. You must constantly cut the scope to fit the risk and the deadline and available resources. And the only way to do this fit, the only way to do this fit is to invest in project design. You must know the time cost curve, you must know the true throughput, you must know the complexity, the efficiency, and of course the risk. And like I mentioned, you have to do risk decompression. You want to maximize the ability of this battered team to actually go and deliver. You want to invest in productivity increment, and even though those things may cost you even more, since recovery is short term, you could actually go and, and afford it. And again, remember, they're going to acquiesce because the alternative is canceling this project. And something is better than nothing. What do you do after the recovery plan? Now, after the recovery itself, it's important to disengage. The project must stand on its own feet. And don't do these things for more than the first or second milestone. If the third milestone is also under recovery, that is bad. If, this, if, if continuous work requires the wolf, that is bad. The project hasn't really recovered. The patient needs to leave the emergency room. Now, that doesn't mean that you lose contact with them in, 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 in perpetuity. It's a good idea to stay in contact for periodic health checks. You want to do it behind the scene, but you want to constantly stay all-knowing. You want to constantly talk to people and send them emails and see them in the hallway. And the reason is, what if there's a deterioration? What if you have to step back? If you have to step back, there will be no time for doing this whole expensive post-mortem and salvage and damage control. You have to step in, magically appear, fully informed, even before asked to do so, and slap them back into formation. Now, there's some classic mistakes 
and I've seen people doing recovery. One is throwing more people on it. In fact, in general, working harder, doing more of the same will not recover the project. If anything, it will make it work worse, and there's several reasons for it. First of all, larger team would be less efficient. Less efficient may, may, means things are getting worse. But the other problem is, if there's a critical path there, and, you, and the critical path is already fully staffed, throwing more people on it doesn't make anything. It just makes things worse. The other classic mistake is being locked in the sense of a false recovery. There's a number of reasons why this is happening. One is, you did recovery, but not forcefully enough. Either the steps you took were you did it too weak, or you didn't do all the steps you needed to. These weak attempts do recover some elements or many elements of the project, but because the underlying problems are not addressed, you basically have reached the eye of the storm, and then the second half of the hurricane is going to hit you full bow on. Uh, it's very similar to the defibrillator effect, you know. If you take a defibrillator, you apply it on a dead cat, the dead cat would still bounce. It doesn't mean the cat is alive. And so you don't want to be locked into this false recovery. Oh, yeah, we recovered it. Also, it's important to know that recovery often behaves seesaw. Uh, amazing results, and then you sink back, and then amazing results again. So don't get stuck at either end. Um, you may have recovered the pulse, and then the, com the patient may go into coma again, and then you revive the patient, and so on. You have to realize it will behave seesaw. Let's talk a little bit about long-term recovery. What we discussed so far was the eminent step you need to do to recover the project to prevent it from cancelling. That doesn't mean you're out of the danger zone. In fact, recovery is an excellent opportunity to go back to the basis. In fact, the crisis is a great opportunity to drive change, to drive long-term recovery. Now is your time to redefine project fundamentals. Post-recovery is your chance to do the opposite of the things that made things uh, worse here. And so you want to do the opposite of quick and dirty across quality, process, and architecture. Now, if you go back to the basics, you have to realize the root cause of the failure was almost always abandoning the basics, abandoning the good hygiene. The post-mortem's job is to convince others that is so. So the root, root cause of the problem was not having enough people. You had enough people. You didn't invest enough in quality. You didn't have architecture. You didn't have project design. That was the root cause. And the post-mortem, because it's so well documented, is a great way of convincing them. Now, the place to take care of the basics is post-recovery. Now, you may be able to afford post-recovery to establish the best practices. But sometimes you can't afford to wait post-recovery. And so you have to devise some kind of an improvement plan based on the post-mortem. And you want to incorporate now as much as you can and remove the rest post-recovery. Now, sometimes the situation is so bad, there may not be something left for post-recovery. But almost always, that's not necessarily the case. So let's talk about what does it mean going back to the basics. Let's talk about quality. And specifically, I'm talking about quality control, not quality assurance. Quality control. You have to get, even for a small size team, at least one or two test engineers. Now, test engineers are not testers. Test engineers are full-fledged software engineers whose job is to write software to break the software you're shipping for customers. Test engineers are single-handedly the best quality control tool you can possibly have. Now, if you may not have the recs for test engineers, that's fine. You assign two developers for being the test engineers for the project. Best thing to do here would be to take, take your top two developers, the best senior developers, and use them as test engineers. Another quality control maneuver is to increase the ratios of testers and developers. A Bourbon ratio is one to one. Yes, you heard me right, a Bourbon ratio. Now, does it mean it can't be higher? Yes, you could have two testers for one developers, and indeed that is a good ratio for high quality systems, but a bourbon ratio is one to one. Now, you may not have the recs for using one to one, you know what? Use developers. You typically have too many developers and too few testers. Another worth mitigating it is hiring subcontractors. I wouldn't hire a subcontractor for a test engineer, but I would definitely hire a subcontractor as a tester. Another technique is to devise a test plan for the new system and build on the side a test harness for it. 
you have to have a test plan for each component. So not just for the system, but for each component. And you have to do unit testing for each component. You have to adopt zero tolerance policy for defects at the component level. It is absolutely important to have defects at the components level. Every component, every service must be, must be rock solid. If it's not, the inherent complexity of a modular system comprising of 20, 30, 40 services would simply kill quality. The individual components must be rock solid. Now, it doesn't mean you're not going to have system level defects, but at least you have a chance of achieving that if the components have no defects. Now, what does zero tolerance mean? Zero tolerance means if you have a defect at the component, nobody goes home, nobody goes to a meeting, nobody goes for lunch. Short of a family emergency, you stay and you fix it. You have to invest in defensive programming everywhere. You have to use assertion. Every assumption must be asserted. If you know about code contract and your technology have, uh, makes it available, invest in code contract. Make the compiler your friend. You have to do logging, extensive logging. In fact, you can't do too much logging. You have to have full, full-fledged flight recorder for your project. You have to invest in diagnostic, in tracing, the ability to see post-fact what happened, why, what caused the failure. You have to set goals for ongoing decreasing cyclomatic complexity. Measure the entire project words and all get a number. From now on, that's the line in the sand. We cross it. From now on, everything that we do has to decrease the cyclomatic complexity. It doesn't matter if we do coding activities, quality control activities, refactoring activities. It doesn't matter. You want to see not just decrease cyclomatic complexity. It has to be in an L curve, meaning at the beginning, we decrease it a lot, and as time goes by, we decrease it less. Back to the basic process-wise, you have to get an architect. One of the reasons the project probably failed is because it didn't have a skilled, qualified architect doing decomposition into services. So you know what? Post-recovery, you need an architect. And you need the architect not just for doing the architecture. You need it because the architect would enforce the architecture, make sure developers stay on the plan. If developers are hell-bent on butchering the architecture, no amount of reviews can help it. The architect has to be there, sell the design to architects, evangelize the concepts, sit on all the design reviews, and so on. You have to invest in project design. Post recovery, there should be no excuse for ever deviating from scheduled budget commitments. And so there has to be meticulous project design, post recovery, com combined, of course, with the tracking. That is, of course, the job of both the architect and the project manager. You have to invest in quality assurance, not quality control. There has to be a person, typically at a level above that particular project, that looks at the entire process in the company and say, how can we tune that to assure quality? How could we correct things, do what cause analysis? How can we prevent things from happening in the first place? You have to invest in simulators and emulators. Every component in the project, you have to be able to emulate it so you can do fast development. You have to be able to simulate it so you can simulate errors, rare risk conditions, weird I.O. and so on. You need to be able to test and diagnose every component in isolation, in separation from the other components in the project. You have to adopt comprehensive coding and development standards. One developer's handwriting must look like the other developer's handwriting. You want to leverage all the best practices known to men about how to do these things in the context of your team. You should never invent the wheel. You have to invest in peer reviews, not just code review, but requirement review, design review, test plan review for every component so that you have rock solid components. Back to the basics on architecture. Even if with the best architecture, your project will fail if you don't have the correct handoff between the architect and developers. You see, if your team has a good ratio of CN to join developers, you can hand off pretty much at the top level design. You say to the developers, look, there's some components here. You go and figure out things like contracts and class hierarchies and, 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 and patterns. But if you have junior developers, they can't figure it out. They won't be able to do things like factor interfaces and class hierarchies and design patterns. And they will butcher it. And they will have classes with 17 subclasses. And they will have methods that take 25 different arguments. Don't trust your junior developers. If your team is mostly junior developers, you have to invest much more in doing the digital design up front. And in the, in the architect's masterclass, we call it a handoff. So you have to identify the correct handoff moving forward. You have to design the services in the area of minimal cost. That is absolutely key. Because even if you have the right architecture, if the contracts make the services too coarse, or too small, or too many, or too few, or too chatty, 
the system would gravitate in a non-linear way to be too expensive, and that would kill the project. You have to identify the core use cases. You never design the actual requirements. You identify the core use cases, the three, four, five, six things which represent the essence of the system. You design against all those core use cases. In fact, you make sure your decomposition satisfies the core use cases, and you only design against the core use cases. Now, all the other use cases represent merely permutation of the core use cases, and such many use cases change, your decomposition will not. And that is the hallmark of a good design. You have to design the correct architecture in the first place. You have to identify the volatility in the system and only decompose based on volatility, encapsulating the areas of change, as we show in the Architects Masterclass. Our time is almost up. Let's discuss some resources here, and then we'll take some questions. On the Edison website, idesign.net slash project dash recovery, there's a lot of material about project recovery. We also have the iDesign private alumni forum where you get to discuss uh, these things as well as process, project design, and architecture. We now discuss uh, project recovery in the project design masterclass. We didn't used to, but now we're doing it simply because we recognize that most projects will probably need that kind of a thing before they can apply the various project design techniques we do. Our next project design masterclass is November 3rd this year, 2014, in San Jose, California. And uh, I think it's time. Maybe we can do some questions. So let me thank you all for joining. And I'll see you on our next uh, webcast. Now let's see some uh, questions. Uh, Chris is asking if there's any seats left in the November class. Uh, yeah, I, I do still have some seats left. Excellent. That's a very good point. The, our master classes sell out anywhere from three to six months in advance. And so we estimate the project design master class probably sell out by the fall. Yeah, so uh, to Chris Samoa, this, we are rolling it into the project design master class. You may have missed my comment on it. Um, this is part of the project design master class now. And, and, and my key for actually doing it was the realization that you have to do the design around 0 0.5 risk, which only if you took the project design masterclass, you actually know what it means and you know how to do it. And so it felt a bit sterile just doing the recovery as part of the AMC, where nobody knows about risk management. So I, I decided the right place for doing it is in the project design masterclass, even though, as you saw from this webcast, there's so many issues uh, touching on the architect masterclass, especially with commitment for quality, with architecture, with process, and so on. So John Phillips asks, when I'm saying component, so I specifically don't want to limit the talk of, of recovery for just things like service orientation. So I'm avoiding the word service. Now, if you're using the iDesign method taxonomies, and of course, components would be managers, engines, resource access, clients, and so on. Yes, of course. But you know what? It's unlikely that if you have a method-driven uh, project, you would ever need recovery. So probably would never happen. Do we touch on project recovery in a clinic? No. The architecture clinic is purely on architecture. We practice the method. So it's your opportunity for doing anywhere from 10 to 15 systems, because you get to see your system plus everybody else's system. And we don't really do project recovery. now. What I used to do when I was doing clinics is the last day I would pick one of the systems and I would do soup to nuts project design on it. I would start with the uh, architecture, go into dependency diagrams, draw the network, uh, do the estimation, do broadband estimation with the clinic members, do a broadband, uh, do a broad project estimation from the tool, do critical pass analysis, calculate the duration, staffing distribution, calculate the cost, build the uh, S-curve and measure the risk and build basically the full normal solution and doing all of that in one day. And there was basically smoke coming out of the cable by the time I'm done. But the point I was trying to drive is that these things don't take long. So if you know what you're doing, it takes a day, maybe three days if you're not that experienced. But it doesn't take three weeks to do these things. Right? OK, now there's a wonderful question. If you make a guess of how many projects are out there that should be killed compared to the number of one that can be recovered. 
So, so let's answer that question from, from two perspectives. One is projects we wish would die, and that would be overwhelming. I mean, these monstrosities, these aberrations should not have allowed to persist to begin with. So the purist in us, the engineer, says, you know what? All of them should have died. But the other side to it is that, with a few exceptions, there is almost no project that cannot be recovered and salvaged. And I know it sounds strange. And in fact, the, the reason is that uh, um, is so because the more uh, imploded the project is, the less hope there is. In fact, it's easier to recover because they've given all hope. And when they give all hope, they're open for change. And now, when they're open for change, you can recover them. Now, in complete disaster scenarios, your salvage operation will come empty-handed. You will have to do new architecture, and then you'll cover that. And so there's almost no uh, project that you cannot recover. And the worst basket cases are the ones that, in a counterintuitive way, are the easiest to recover. Now, I know you didn't, you didn't expect to, see, to hear that answer, but that's kind of like the, the uh, uh, soup to nuts uh, honest answer. Any more questions? OK, better things that uh, finishes it. Thank you all, and I'll see you on the next webcast and on the alumni.